Okay. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start with the launch of the landscape investment and finance tool. Please take seats. The front rows are still free and they will remain free. So please uh, take the front seats. No one is going to sit there. Like the speakers don't need the front row. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Very nice to meet you. So um, I propose that everyone sits already on the stage. Yeah. And then there's still seats in, f in the front row. Please don't hesitate. We obviously are nice people and we're not going to... Uh... Well, you know, we are at the Global Landscapes Forum. I mean... Okay. So, welcome everyone at the launch of the Landscape Investment and Finance Tool. I'm very pr my name is Jan-Willem den Besten. I work for IUCN Netherlands Committee. And I'm very proud uh, to be here at this point. Uh, we started uh, the work on this uh, quite extensive tool in uh, February with our friends from Eco Agriculture Partners. And uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, the test version of the tool is online and is ready for, uh, for use and testing by, uh, by people, who, whoever is interested, who work in a, in a landscape program. And uh, so we're here to launch it. And we have already done two tests, and uh, we're going to hear about that. So landscapes, uh, we I have already heard a lot about uh, the, the topic. Uh, I think the, the key things about landscapes is that it's, it's about integration. It's about integration across levels, levels of governance, uh, levels at which value chains have different actors from the landscape to outside the landscape. And it's about integration within the landscape, integration of interests, inter integration of sectors, uh, collaboration between all these various actors, whether they're economic, government, uh, uh, local communities, you know, people with interests, people with rights, people with uh, uh, an interest in the landscape, they have to come together and come to integrated solutions. And finance is only one part of that, but also in finance, integration of different types of finance is very important. It's not only international finance that is needed for the landscapes where we work, it is also local finance, local banks, local financial institutions. It is existing finance that might have to be uh, reworked to be able to do something in a different way so that it contributes to the landscape uh, priorities or in a way that it uh, reduces negative impacts. And so the, the landscape uh, investment and finance tool does that it's, it is uh, developed for multi-stakeholder landscape uh, programs where different people from different sectors sit together and together make decisions about key uh, priorities with specific financial needs. So we will hear from Seth Sham uh, from Eco Agriculture Partners uh, later uh, this session about what the, t the tool exactly entails. Um, Michaelin Bauer from Solidaridad Central America, Mexico and Caribbean office will uh, tell us about the testing of the tool that is right now happening in uh, Honduras. Um, Gerard Mulder from IUCN is going to uh, tell us about the test of the tool that happened in the Cagayan de Oro basin landscape in the Philippines. But first and foremost, I would like to give the floor to Omer van Rentenchem from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the ministry that actually, through a couple of programs, have made it possible for us to develop this tool with the generous support uh, that we have had over the years and still have. And so I would like to give the floor to Omer 
to officially launch the tool. Thank you, uh, Jan Willem. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, the tool. Five years ago, we at the ministry started our journey, a long journey on the landscape thinking, because our aim was to build on the work we have supported on value chains. And it was uh, Solidaridad who gave us a wake-up call, so it's good to have Solidaridad here next to me. And the wake-up call was, in fact, that with certification in value chain and the value chain work, it will not be enough to secure sustainable production. The sourcing landscapes are vital, so yeah, that concluded in their annual report, for sustainable production. So since then, we started and looked around at private sector involvement and how we can extend that to the broader landscape. At that time, uh, finance and investment, when we were on that journey in landscape, was not a great issue. I remember there was impact investors like Althelia and Moringa and they were giving support by FMO, the Dutch DFI. And now, five years later, on this journey, it seems to rapidly change. For instance, in the ministry, we have even a, a team working on innovative finance. But at the landscape level, I still see Altelia and Moringa as the examples, as the frontrunners that were the frontrunners five years ago. So what happens there and what is needed, I think, is important to realize, no? And here I like to compare, as others did yesterday, with the renewable energy. 10 to 15 years ago, I think there was a small business, nobody wanted to invest, and now the Netherlands is starting investment in wind parks in the Netherlands on the North Sea without subsidy. I think nobody could have thought about that 10 years ago. That's the challenge, I think, for landscapes. And this pavilion illustrates its serious business. It's growing in importance. And lift is an example of it. Lift can maybe lift up this whole system, and a tool that can be used to provide insights in the landscape financial situation. I think it's valuable, it can help analyze the landscape as we need to have this information. Let me have a look, okay. Based on our policy, we have a policy of trade and development, I would like to mention three topics which might be of interest to take into account when looking at lift. The one is people first, the second projects everywhere, and the third, planet, ecosystems, and what else? Let me go to the first, sorry. Leave no one behind is the people first issue, and how? People live somewhere, they live in a location, they live in a landscape, and they're often also attached to this landscape. We perhaps tend to forget that. We get them around the table thinking of people, planet, profit, Landscape programs invest a lot, and around the table is not enough, I think. It's creating landscape, but it's not the only thing. People first means more. And our hypothesis is that a landscape approach to sustainable development is also an approach to reach the sustainable development goals. And in such a way that actions have multiple benefits, multiple SDGs. For instance, we started with PBL, the Netherlands, and eco-agriculture, uh, a scenario analysis with Solidaridad, and that was in Honduras. So Michael Lynn will really go deeper into this, and I think that's very interesting, because people have different interests, different ambitions, and what happened in, so in, at the program in Solid of Solidaridad in Honduras is looking at these ambitions, combining them at the landscape level, and look what it contributes to the SDGs. The scenario analysis was used to have business as usual versus business in the landscape. And what you see is, if you look at this table, that SDG 1 and SDG 2 did very badly because they were 200%, 100% below. That was a lesson, started the dialogue, so that's a very good lesson. But it also has implications for finance, and I hope they changed the, the whole set because if I talk about people first, this is people last and uh, land first. So I think this you can learn from the scenario. So what does it mean to lift? How did they work with it. I think it's a challenge and I hope Michael is able to explain a bit more on how that will help bringing finance to that landscape. Then projects everywhere. When I look at the Dutch policy of trade and development cooperation, we have three priori of several priorities, water, food security, climate, and the result is that you see projects everywhere. Projects everywhere in the landscape that don't have any synergy. And 
The Dutch are not the only ones. I mean, there are loads of donors, organizations, private companies. So what's happening in the landscape? There are loads of projects. And I think this is a challenge for, the, for Lyft. Do you take into account all these existing programs when you talk about finance and how can you lift them up in your synergy model? Then third, planets, ecosystems, and what's more. The landscape approach is about land and water management, about agriculture, sorry, production, trade, and industry, and tourism, and about protection of ecosystems. And we have a lot of debate on ecosystem services, and as you can see, there's loads of services, and often at the landscape level, we focus on these different approaches of ecosystem service, and we bring them into the account. To invest in it, we need the means to invest in ecosystem services, and that's maybe what Lyft is focusing on. But when I look at the training course of eco-agriculture in Africa, I see this picture, which risk and resources everywhere, choices to be made. How are you dealing with the city, with urban, rural areas? Where do you, can, where do you link up to? And I think this complicates a lot the whole situation. What are the risks and resources at the landscape? How do you invest them? And I think this is another challenge I would give to Lyft. How do you deal with this? And uh, maybe Gerard is able to link it a bit because it's related to a training course and it can, Lyft can be finally integrated into the training course where this is a model of how you deal with the landscape. So I think that's the interesting challenge that's ahead of us. Concluding, we started in 2012 on our journey along track on what to do with landscape and how to integrate it more in our policy of trade and development. We spoke with a large number of organizations and experts in Netherlands and outside of the Netherlands and finally uh, we took our inspiration from Lake Naivasha in uh, Kenya because there WWF uh, government, private sector were working together on a model at uh, managing uh, the local situation. And our challenge was to bring landscape in, uh, business into the landscape and work together with others. That's being realized, or that being realized, not realized, being realized. The next step follows, that's finance. And I think this is the perfect moment to look at Lyft as a tool to help governance linked to finance in the landscape. But there are many challenges, as I said. There's FIFA First, there's SDGs, there are ecosystem services, there's private public investment. And I would say, keep on the right track. Keep your journey on the right track. Be flexible in your application. And look at this, define your landscape, and don't lose track of what you're doing. Thank you very much, and good luck with the instrument. Thanks a lot, Omer, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for your uplifting presentation and introduction that marks the launch of Lyft that is already online. It can be downloaded. And I would now like to give uh, the floor to Seth from Eco Agriculture Partners, who actually explain us what it all is lift. Thank you, Jan Willem. Thank you, Omer. Uh, I'd also like to say that for there are two seats here for people whose legs might be tired, and this is going to be so good you're not going to want to leave early, so it's okay to sit in the front. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, Omer, I really thank you very much for that introduction. I mean, you did, you did use uh, most of the Lyft puns that I was going to use, so I'm going to have to rethink my, my Lyft jokes. Um, but that's okay. I think you, you did a good job with them. Um, so uh, this, this whole process, uh, it's okay. This whole process started from kind of a general observation that, that Omar alluded to that well, there, there was kind of this uptick in, in programs and analysis and investment in sustainable land management generally. Um, you mentioned some of the impact investment funds, but there's, there's, been a, um, there's been a lot of talk, you know, less five years, even, you know, ten years on uh, sustainable investment in land. But what we were observing is that a lot of this was still focused on kind of uh, entry points were single objectives. So whether there were single environmental objectives like sort of stop deforestation or improve water or carbon sequestration, or maybe it was a single objective in the sense of let's improve the sustainability of a single supply chain, you know. Um, it's a lot of innovation, but it, it didn't seem to be uh, linked up. There wasn't a, a full uh, kind of landscape context. 
So <clears throat> that's essentially um, where we came from. There's a lot of interest in, in landscape approaches. So what does it mean to develop a financial plan from a landscape perspective? So from on the ground, not even necessarily from the, the investor point of view, the financial mechanisms, which there was innovation. But if you're on the ground, if you're part of a landscape partnership, how do you develop a plan to get finance for all of the things that you need, not just one thing that you need? So, um, yeah, we have some, uh, some fun issues here. But essentially what I'm going to talk about today uh, is going to give the conceptual background of, of where this came from and then talk about the objectives for the tool uh, itself, for Lyft itself. It's broken up into two different documents. There's the primer, which is kind of a compendium guidance document, and then the manual itself, which is sort of the step-by-step -step process that if you do it precisely right, you will get financing for all of your wildest dreams. So, yeah, is that a good, is that good? Are you, is that convincing? All right, so Omer uh, showed a version of this. So this is kind of first principles. What do we mean by a integrated landscape or maybe a sustainable landscape? It is one where the elements of the landscape, the investments and the activities are all um, working together in some sort of intentional way. So what we have here, okay, maybe you are working on a project with smallholder farmers doing climate smart agriculture practices or sustainable land management practices. That's going on here. Let's say they were doing cocoa agroforestry. So that doesn't exist on its own in a vacuum. I think what I'm saying here for everyone at the Global Landscapes Forum, this is probably pretty obvious, but I will uh, say it again for re re uh, reiteration purposes, and we'll go back to this figure in a moment too, so I, I want to describe what it is. So for these farmers, we need water. We need protected areas. And the for watershed, which also provides habitat, ecosystem services, opportunity for tourist income, Nearby forests contribute to microclimate. These are all beneficial to these smallholder farmers. These smallholder farmers may um, provide inputs into the local agro-processing plant, which also needs investment. It is then trading with actors outside of the landscape. Maybe they're trading for export, or they're, giving, um, they're providing food to the local city that needs it, and the local city also needs water. So this is integrated landscape. So, integrated landscape requires integrated landscape management. Integrated landscape management, in the very kind of short version, is a process. So, this is a cycle you can find in something called the Little Sustainable Landscapes book. Uh, we don't have any copies here, but there are a number of people who are around today who were uh, authors on this that helped to kind of define what a sustainable landscape. Essentially, it's about bringing together people in some kind of an idealized version, multi-stakeholder platform, developing a shared understanding of the issues within the landscape, developing a plan and action agenda for collaborative planning, moving into implementation, and then monitoring, and then doing it all over again. And if you're doing that well, then you get this. So where are we here with this landscape investment finance tool? We are around, around this area, okay? What we're trying to do is first understand the financial needs within the landscape and then develop some specific action plans for how we can access finance for the activities and for the investments we decided were critical in the landscape to achieve an integrated landscape, okay? So, another definition. So, in, in word terms, an integrated landscape investment, what does that mean, okay? So, the first couple of components of what an integrated landscape investment is, it's very similar to you know, sustainability triple bottom line. You know, so it contributes to multiple elements of sustainability as well as financial returns in many cases. It takes into account the socio-ecological processes, spatial interactions, and offsite impacts in the landscape. Conforms with, with public land use and sustainability rules, okay? But 
paid particular attention to these last two. These last two is what makes this kind of unique. It makes it complicated and also unique. So we're not looking just for sustainable investment. We're looking for investment that aligns with the others within the landscape, okay? It intentionally aligns with others in the landscape and also aligns with a vision, okay? A, a long-term vision um, for, you know, long-term vision. Okay, so here's our landscape again, okay? Here are our smallholder farmers. Here's our protected area. Here's our agro-processing facility in our, in our city. On top of this landscape, here's a diagram that kind of overlays a landscape finance system. And don't try to follow along all of this. There are versions of this we can give to you if you really want to study it. But I, I put this up to introduce kind of the key elements of this finance system that are kind of part of the um, sort of the methodology of Lyft. So we have our, our sources of finance. So multiple. So when we say sources, we're talking about private sources. We're talking about companies. We're talking about local banks. We're talking about uh, development banks, public sources of finance, philanthropic funds, um, even potentially institutional investors if there are opportunities. So these are all sources. And these sources make different types of investments. We uh, refer to asset investments and enabling investments. So these solid lines are asset investments. So solid line, go from a community bank to an agroforestry pro uh, project. It's something that's tangible, an asset investment that usually has return associated with it. Okay? It could be the agro-processing facility, or it can be a certain type of transition to a new agricultural practice or reforestation. An enabling investment creates the conditions for these asset investments to work. We have dotted lines that go towards um, a supportive policy framework, governance, which the last session was about. It could support uh, improved governance frameworks, research and sustainable land management. These are all enabling investments. And these all need to work together. So in the context of this LIFT tool, we're looking not to, just to develop projects with financial returns. That's a big part of it. And that's like probably the big nut to crack. But it's also kind of business planning for the enabling investments as well. Um, what we have here, this sort of funnel, is the role of kind of coordination, facilitation at the landscape scale. So essentially what Lyft is, is like a, it's a how-to manual for this multi-stakeholder platform to attract investment and to coordinate investment. That's what we're trying to do here. We're, we're right here. Pull this together either in a formal way or an informal way. Objectives of the tool. Analyze financing needs strengthen business ideas, identify potential sources of finance, develop strategies to secure this funding, uh, and then also, more broadly, encourage stronger involvement of financial actors within landscape platforms. I should say that, that the Landscape for People, Food, and Nature initiative that helped organize this pavilion has done a series of studies that identified integrated landscape initiatives around the world. And one of the key findings in doing this analysis is that business and financial actors are rarely involved in these landscape partnerships. So that's also another impetus for this work. How can we get financial actors more involved earlier in the process? Additional objectives, financial literacy among landscape actors, so they're in a better negotiating position, that they, they know what they're talking about. Uh, knowledge sharing among these partners for financial opportunities, uh, opportunities for co-investment and coordinated investment among actors when they know we, what the others are doing, uh, potentially developing advoc advocacy campaigns. You may find in this process that the key issue is not only attracting new investment, but the problem is that the investment that is going large scale into your landscape for, let's say, a gold mine, which is an example um, we've worked with, is crowding out any other uh, effort to build more sustainable business. So you actually, what you need is an advocacy campaign to shift financial flows more than you need 
to attract money. So that could come out of this. Um, and developing new types of innovative financial mechanisms that no one's ever thought of before could come. All right, our primer. Oh, two. Oh, okay. I'll go, I'll go quickly. So the, the primer, uh, I went through some of these questions already, but you can find this in the document. Uh, sort of it's the what is integrated landscape management, what are the investments, et cetera. We also get into some interesting issues about um, how mechanisms can work together in bl blended uh, mechanisms and how financing can be coordinated, which characteristics of finance are most appropriate for certain types of investment, okay? And then I'll go through a couple of minutes what's actually in the tool. So the tool of Lyft has three, we call them stages, okay? The first one is to assess the needs of priority investments in the landscape. The second is to find appropriate, the appropriate types of finance and also to identify the specific investors that can match to the investments that you've identified. And the third is to come back together to share information on this process and develop kind of the next steps on a finance mobilization strategy. And it's also a cycle. You can sort of go ahead and, and, and do this all forever. The first stage, convene your team, which can include members of your landscape partnership that are particularly interest in, interested in finance and you, who are experts potentially in the landscape and know who the actors are. So this is kind of very broad. This can be different, different in different places. Translate your landscape action plan. We assume that the people using this tool are already part of a kind of a landscape partnership and have a sense of action. Translate them into investment ideas. Um, and we have a variety of tools for how to do that. Um, select which investments make the most sense for, um, for mobilization. And then develop business plans, more in-depth business plans for each of these ideas. And there are... Um, here are just some examples from uh, what we did in the Philippines of what might come out of this first stage. Um, this is not comprehensive. May Gerhard will say a little bit more about this. So went through this process. Here's a few things that came out of the, a, a, a workshop where they decided, oh, well, what, do we, what are most our priority investments? So, well, there's an enabling investment, which is we need to strengthen our river basin platform. So that's one thing. We want to develop a, a PES, a payment for ecosystem service scheme uh, within our watershed. And by the way, there's some really interesting opportunities with Kenmer International to do intercropping with cocoa and indigenous trees. And we're going to create a business plan around that and we're going to find a bank willing to support it. So this is like a first round of discussion. You could come up with 10 of these or 20 of these, but these are just some examples. And then for each of them, there's a champion behind it who's leading it forward. So it's not just like a big blob of landscape partnership doing all of this. As these investments come up, there's, there are individual people who are kind of, who are taking this on, you know? Um, some of the tools we have in this first stage to develop these business ideas, this is a version of the business model canvas that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it's a very popular methodology for building out business ideas. We've modified it to make it more landscape-y. Uh, you can't read it all here, but if you get the version, uh, if you download the document, you can find our landscape business model canvas here. Um, I should also say there's a really good net present value tool that's in there. Uh, Comp with, uh, put together by, by Gerhard here, which is um, something you could use at this stage. It's also something you could use at a later stage, depending on how much detail you want when you approach an investor for the first time. Stage two, scoping the potential sources of finance. So this is usually where there's a workshop where the, the champions of these different investment ideas come together with experts in the landscape who know kind of the financial opportunities there and, you know, and elsewhere outside of the landscape. So you identify the potential investors, the type of investors. We go through an exercise, you know, is this something that should get a short-term loan or is this something that really requires uh, impact equity investment? What do you really want to do and who is appropriate to talk to? So once you figure out that category, of person, then you can you sort of crowdsource ideas for, well, well, who do we all know individually who we can make an um, approach to? I know I'm, I'm running town, so I'll uh, go quickly. Um, and then we, there's a first approach that's made. 
with these uh, potential investors and sort of an interview process where you find out from them what is needed. So you, kind of, you can kind of go sort of in an informational interview, if you will. This is how much we know. What more do we need to know to meet your processes? What forms do we need to fill out? What information don't we have that you need? So that happens. You go back. You collect the information and figure out who you want to go after uh, most. Again, these are just some examples of how we figure out what the um, appropriate type of finance is. Uh, we look at time frame, risk appetite, deal size. We have some tools in, uh, that, that demonstrate you know, where are the different types of investors along the deal size, risk, time horizon you know, spectrum. We have a kind of a blank version of this. You can sort of fill out yourself and then overlay this on top of it, which gives you some sense. Um, and finally, stage three, coming back together, digesting what each of these kind of investment champions have learned, um, seeing if there's, there's synergies, um, seeing whether they, well, hey, you know, I talked to the local bank, they couldn't help us out, but maybe they can help you out. Turns out I can't do anything here because nobody has land title. What we really need to do is work on land titling. Um, that becomes sort of the, fin the next step financial strategy. And then you can do this work in a loop forever and get more and more integrated investments um, and sharing the strategy with a full landscape partnership. And that's, that's, basically, that's basically it. Thanks for the time, Jan. Thanks a lot, Seth. The good news is that I just heard that we have till 11 and not till 10.45. So we have a little bit of extra time. So it is very important to, to, to understand the manual and to go through the manual very well. It's like getting an IKEA uh, set of furnitures for your house. But the, the, the biggest fun is to see someone who is in the middle of unpacking their IKEA set of furnitures and see them struggle while they're in the midst of it. So we have two examples of that. These are actually two landscapes that are kind of almost halfway applying the tool. So let's hear what I have to say. So Mike Lynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan Willem. Um, Seth, I don't know. Yeah, thank you very much. Go ahead. The next, or which one? This, this one? I got it. OK. Um, I'm here today to speak with you about our experience in Honduras. And I'm really thrilled to be able to do that. Many of you know Honduras is going through quite some political convulsions, and it's really nice to bring a story of, of change and, and positive dynamics coming from this part of the world. First and foremost, I want to introduce Solidaridad. We are a global network organization. We have nine what we call regional expertise centers. And as Omer mentioned, we have been focusing on commodity-based sustainability over the last almost uh, 30 years, I would say, really. <laughs> but about since 2012, um, with funding from the Dutch ministry in Central America and Mexico, we have been looking at the five round tables. So specifically in the context of Honduras, we were looking at how to move the entire palm oil sector to sustainability using the RSPO standard as a guide for best practices. And um, what we found in Honduras was that we really needed to, from the beginning, launch a multi-stakeholder platform of at least the palm oil companies, so multi-stakeholder in that sense, in order to co-design the proposal as we wanted to see it um, be implemented over the following three years. And shortly after we began the implementation process in Honduras, we began to realize the power of that space. The power of that space and the potential for it to move into a longer term or existence beyond the life of that project, which was only gonna be three years, in order to um, generate a, a process of dialogue and consensus building and conflict resolution because where there's palm oil, there is conflict. It's, it's inevitable. And um, there's also a lot of other conflicts in the landscape, but um, we were really beginning to identify the power of that. And so initially we began with three palm oil companies 
by the time we launched the project, there were five. Within two months' time, it went up to eight. One year later, we had ten companies, and there was only one outlier who is now incorporated in. We work with 100% of the palm oil sector, looking for complete transformation of their practices on the ground. Um, and now, as we are leveraging that work with palm oil to expand our work, Seth showed a diagram of the process of developing the multi-stakeholder platform, uh, uh, shared understanding, design, implementation, monitoring, and then moving back to that. We've already gone through that cycle with the palm oil consortium, which we call Palma de Aceite Sostenible de Honduras. And we, in recent years, about two years ago, began to realize that in their journey to palm oil certification, um, there were certain um, issues or problems that the palm oil sector was not going to be able to resolve on their own, and that we needed to expand that platform to include other actors who would engage in the dialogue and the consensus building and, and identification of solutions. So while in Solidaridad, the core of our work still is with the producer, which can be from the smallholder all the way up to industrial actors and multinational companies, we are also moving into what we call the robust infrastructure structure, which is creating the enabling environment, as you mentioned, um, so that we can eventually scale up to the landscape level. Um, I would like to just comment to the ministry that also this financing that we are utilizing in Honduras at that time, at this time, is actually an enabling investment. This is not an asset investment that, that we are utilizing and implementing in Honduras. It's an enabling investment, and we are hoping that this work with Paisajes Sostenibles, or PASOS, um, actually creates um, a generator or an incubator for landscape-level interventions over the long term and not with this current funding cycle with which we are working. And of course, um, surrounding the sustainable landscape, there's work to be done at the national level, uh, policy influencing, and markets for Solidaridad in our work, commodity-based work, um, are a prerequisite for success. Um, this is the landscape in the Zona Literal del Norte. Yes, five minutes, okay. Um, you won't be able to see the legend here, but in, in these areas of kind of russet colored is where we have palm oil concentration. The light brown is mixed and livestock. So there's a lot of interaction between livestock and palm oil, as well as potential for agroforestry systems, cacao-centric agroforestry systems. And um, one thing that does characterize this landscape is that most of the producers are smallholders. There's not a large presence of very large plantations in the zone. And many of the palm oil producers also have livestock. They also have basic grains. They also have cacao. And they also are growing uh, citrus and other crops. And so this is the modeling that was done uh, with PBL, the Environmental Assessment. Assessment Agency within the Ministry of the Environment in the Netherlands. And this is what we were linking to the SDGs in, in a workshop. In May of 2017, we, uh, with Eco Agriculture Partners, did the intensive um, course for integrated landscape management, which we later dubbed the super intensive course for integrated <laughs> landscape management. Uh, and um, we utilize this landscape modeling in order to get people to think about the trends under the business as usual scenario, as opposed to the potential impacts and trade-offs um, looking at it or through the lens of integrated landscape management. And that really was a profound exercise for people to really begin to engage in dialogue around what their priority actions would be and developing a shared vision. This is just a little bit of our journey over the last five years in working in this landscape, the 2013-2015 uh, time frame in which we had the Palm Oil Partners, which also had some government actors and some civil society organizations involved in the platform, um, in which we had 10 actors. 
under our Mesoamerican Palm Oil Alliance because now we are working in palm oil in Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico, almost 100% of all the actors. Um, we have now expanded to include some unions and more increased civil society organization presence. And now in our Paisaje Sostenibles phase of 2016-2020, we have... Um, I think it's five to seven municipalities that are involved in, in uh, PASOs. We have producer associations. We have a higher level of uh, government agencies. And we have participation of 100% of the industrial base uh, for palm oil in Honduras. So it's a very dynamic. And we're looking at really how do we achieve the scale and the speed in the landscape. Very good. Um, this is from our intensive course. Uh, one of the objectives of that course was that this group of people would self-organize into working groups around their priorities and their passions and their interests in the landscape. That course generated six working groups, palm oil, water, cacao, monitoring biodiversity, um, the larger management of the multi-stakeholder platform to ensure there was communication and synergies amongst those groups. And since then, those groups have been meeting on a regular basis with minimal seed funding to cover their costs to engage in the proposal development. That is, in fact, the phase one of the LIFT tool that we were doing without having knowledge of the LIFT tool. That doesn't mean we won't be using that in the future because, as I mentioned, we see PASOS as a generator, as an incubator for landscape level interventions over the long term. We're looking at how to build permanence in the face of instability in Honduras. This is uh, the working group around agroecotourism. This is a photograph from two days ago. They're working diligently on their proposal uh, to be presented and to be reviewed in the phase two of the LIFT tool, which is scheduled for the week of January 15th in Honduras. Seth will be joining us there, along with another colleague of Eco Agriculture Partners. We have selected two or three representatives from each of the working groups to participate in a two-day workshop to characterize their investment needs and to identify what type of investor, going all the way from the traditional donor through blended finance, through traditional finance to potential impact investors, in order to shortlist um, whom they should be in communication with and utilizing the tool that Seth showed you, how they can then go about in their teams this group of maybe 12 to 15 actors, to gather that intelligence and to begin to s establish communication on what are the strategies, what are the interests, what is this funding cycle, what are the funding caps, what are the conditions in order to be able to get that, and then start to refine their proposals around them. That exercise is going to have a double um, objective as well, because in April, of 2018, we have, well, this is a, this is a show of investable opportunities and in landscapes. So I, I mentioned the six working groups, but we are currently developing proposals around clean energy and effluent management at the industrial level huge amount of impact investment potential there. We are looking at how to replace oil palm that is encroaching on slopes with cacao-centric agroforestry systems under a proven business model developed by the national, I'm sorry, the uh, Honduran Foundation for Agricultural Investigation. And we are looking at biodiversity monitoring that we are already doing a pilot project with one palm oil company. So there are multiple propositions that are already on the table that we are looking for investment opportunities. And finally, I'm coming back to the save the date in April. In January, we will be preparing for what we are calling the investment fair. And I already have two impact investors lined up to come to Honduras in April uh, in order to learn about sustainable landscapes, in order to learn about the 
zona littoral del norte landscape in order to learn about the different proposals we will do a tour of the landscape so you can see the industrial actors you can see the mesoamerican reef you can see cacao agroforestry systems and how there's synergies that are developing in that landscape even though these are individual proposals there's a direct link between palm oil and cacao so if anyone would be interested in participating in this investment fair in April, please approach me, please let me know, and we will be sure to get you on the mailing list. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mike Lynn. It's amazing how even at this, at this stage of the tool and the tool uh, practice, we already get so much uh, uh, experience, information, and, and things to share. So one of the things we do with the tool is capture the addresses and uh, details of everyone that is testing the tool. And we are going to, uh, to develop a community of practice that stays in touch, that exchanges, that invites each other. And, and we hope that this will really be uh, one of the driving uh, engines behind the tool. So I will give the floor for five minutes to uh, my dear colleague Gerhard, who looks like as if he punched someone and then was punched back. But uh, he actually fell very badly on his bicycle in the snow. You know, the Dutch can't deal with snow. Anyway, I'm very happy that despite his concussion last Friday, Gerard is here to say something about the test of the two in Kakai and the Oro in Philippines. And after that, there's room for questions. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, lesson number one, always wear a helmet. Okay, so that's... Um, first of all, thank you, and thank you for the wonderful presentations and the introductions. Um, so, I'll just speak a few words about our experience in the Philippines and the CDO. Uh, but first of all, uh, just... Two words about myself. I used to be a banker, so this is what a banker looks like. You know, it's a, um, and uh, I've, I've, so I've been on the other side of this discussion. I have been presented with, you know, numerous investment proposals, and if there's one thing that I really disliked, if somebody would come to me unprepared, don't ever come to a banker unprepared with a, you know, shoddy uh, business plan and a half-baked. Excel model, etc. So come prepared, because otherwise you will lose that person's attention. Now, why am I mentioning this? Is because the lift will allow you to prepare properly for a discussion with potential investors or a bank. Um, and I think that is not very unimportant. If we have about 400 landscape initiatives around the world, it is not good that only 25% of those actually have some level of private sector involvement. And it's not even 25% of banks, you know, that our banks are involved, it's probably a less percentage than that. So if landscape initiatives are serious about attracting investments in landscapes, you have to be able to reach out to the financial sector. It's quite simple, and you have to be prepared. So that is the challenge that is before us, and the landscape investment finance tool will allow you to do that. And I think that is very important. It's a very important next level step in terms of uh, where you want to be with landscape initiatives. Um, now, I'll just say a few things about our experience in the uh, CDO. Um, just a few, few remarks, really. Uh, first of all, um, one thing that I noticed when we went to the CDO, um, actually we, we couldn't go there because it was like a state of emergency, it was all bad, so we had to go to some holiday island, which was not a bad thing at all, uh, I, would, I would say. We had a lot of Korean food some, for some reason. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the one thing, though, is that the, the people in the room were very good people. And why was that? Why were there such good people in the room is, uh, for, for this purpose, I would say? Um, because they all of a sudden had an interest because it was about finance. It wasn't about landscape, you know, some... I mean, if you talk to a banker about landscape financing, you'll be like, what, what, are you, what, 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 are you, what are you talking about? Sorry, make it concrete for me. And the lift makes it concrete. It is a structured approach for you to identify opportunities 
uh, w develop those opportunities uh, further and make them to a certain level of professionalism that you can actually have an informed discussion with investors. So that what is, uh, so the, the people in the room said, yeah, you know, we've, we've been asked to, to get involved before, but it really wasn't ever interesting because it was never about money. It was just about policy. It was about, you know, all kinds of things, but it wasn't about money. So that is important. Get the right people at the table in the room. And I think, you know, with your event in, in, in April, you know, that is one thing that, I, you know, having two impact investors uh, involved is, is, is really, uh, really important. Um, the second thing is there's different stages in the lift. But make sure that each stage is closed before you go to the next stage. So you cannot talk about who's going to finance what if you don't have the business model worked out to a certain extent. Because then it becomes all convoluted, it becomes a little messy and foggy, and that is not good. So close off the first stage, then start the next stage. So having that hard cut, I think, is, is um, very important. Thirdly, um, don't talk or don't think on behalf of somebody else. So if you want to have a serious discussion about an investment in a project, you have to have the project developer in the room. Don't think that you can be the person that thinks that is a nice project, but, you know, that project developer uh, may not even be interested. So don't, you know, it's that, that would be pretty much wasting people's uh, time. So those are three uh, things that I'd like to mention on our experience with the CDO in the, in the Philippines. Um, the one thing that I really liked about uh, the funnel um, uh, uh, picture that you, that you have um, yesterday, there was an interesting discussion about investment platforms. And I think, you know, with the multi-stakeholder platform, you know, we're all involved in landscape thinking. And it's all, I, th I think the multi-stakeholder platform approach is very good. But what we need to think about is to what extent is a multi-stakeholder platform suitable for acting as an investment platform? Right? Because within that multi-stakeholder platform, there has to be a level of financial literacy. And either you become the investment platform or you need to work together with an investment platform, whatever is appropriate for the local context. So that is something to keep in mind. Uh, last thing I'd like to talk about is the MPV model, which you mentioned. Thank you very much for that. Um, see, when I was uh, asked, you know, I, coming from the financial side, I was looking for a suitable net present value model. That is basically an Excel spreadsheet that allows you to plug in your revenues, to plug in your costs, and then come up with, you know, does this make sense or not? Is it plus or minus zero? If it's plus zero, you do the project. If it's minus zero, uh, it is, you don't do the project. It is that simple. That's the investment decision. However, I couldn't find any appropriate Excel model for this purpose. So we developed one um, pretty much from scratch, which is very intuitive. Um, and it's a, it has a stepwise approach, like plug in your revenue mo uh, here, you know, plug in your cost there, and then the model will just automatically, you know, calculate everything. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you know, my, my email is, is pretty clear on, in the model somewhere. Uh, so just email it, and I will explain it to you, and I will walk you uh, through it. I'll be happy, very happy to, uh, to do that. So it's an easy, simple, and very intuitive uh, model that will help you to make the right investment decisions. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gerhard. If anyone has or wants to leave, please don't hesitate. But... At the same time, I would like to uh, give the opportunity for, uh, for questions to be asked to our panel. Thanks a lot, everyone, uh, for, uh, for these uh, presentations. Um, do we have a second microphone? Oh, yeah. Maybe. Are there questions? Uh, I had a question about the funnel slide again. Uh, what do you see as some of the 
most effective actors that c create that funnel effect. I, I think you call them landscape investment facilitators on the slide. Should we take a few questions first? Yeah. Let, let's get three, <clears throat> three questions. Hi, thanks. Just a question about how to sustain multi-stakeholder platforms for landscape investment in the long term. I mean, we heard a case where Solidarity Ad seems to be involved long term. There may be cases if there are any financial investors who have sufficiently strong interest, but you're trying to draw in government. How does it sit with government? How do we get stable, stronger institutions in the long term that can deal with landscape investment? Thanks. <clears throat> Another question here. Hello. I had a question about your Excel model, and uh, I wondered, for the figures you're putting in, presumably you're putting in prices of, of crops, do you, how do you predict future prices of crops and this sort of thing? So, a bit of a technical question. Sorry. Let, let's get these three questions, and then we come to the next. So should I go, I'll, yeah. I'll go first? Well, um, I mean, that question is, is really, I mean, okay, it's a complicated question. There are, you know, the, the, the cop-out answer is, is that anyone can play this role. There are a variety of actors that can play this role in the same way that a landscape initiative can be managed by any type of actor. It can be done through a government agency it could be done by an NGO. It could be done by a combination of actors. It could be a very strong farmers organization that, that becomes the landscape partnership broadly. And then from that, either depending on the governance of the partnership, it can be sort of that partnership itself, or they can like, delegate uh, a small group of people who become the essentially like the, the, the like managing uh, the financial elements of the uh, uh, of the landscape. I mean, I, I could ask you know Mike Lynn to describe how it's working in in Solidaridad. You know, her the role that Solidaridad is playing in this coordination versus other actors. Yeah, I would say we're working in collaboration with Eco Agriculture Partners to transfer knowledge and skills first and tools first and foremost, uh, so that everyone is speaking the same language and is able to um, enter into these spaces of dialogue um, and, and move toward consensus and, and building a shared vision for the landscape or different visions within this landscape that are complementary. Um, but Soledaridad's role really is that of a facilitator. And to um, initially we are convening, but this also relates to the question about the sustainability of the platform over the long term. Uh, with the Palm Oil Consortium, um, we did uh, uh, we brought in an external consultant to work on building a governance model for them, and that was a work over several months probably up to 70 individual interviews in order to harvest ideas which were then utilized to um, carry out a workshop over three days in which um, there was agreement made and a document generated around the structure, around the governance, around uh, the rules and the norms and around a financing mechanism for the Palm Oil Consortium. We have not gone so far with the broader multi-stakeholder platform, but it will be a similar approach in which they, a, an external consultant will help formulate that and then in an intensive process come upon a document which will then be formally agreed upon and signed and will include a financing mechanism which does not necessarily require a whole lot of money either. It's about being able to finance the participation and in particular taking into account that there are certain organizations or individuals that do not have access to resources to be able to participate. So ensuring that you can bring someone from the far reaches of Mosquitia uh, on a boat, on a plane, you know, to be able to sit at the table with others and wholly participate and ensure that their communities and their interests are heard. 
Um, so that's Solidaridad's role. And then I think it's just very dynamic. You know, it all really, it really depends on the issues that are being put on the table uh, and the level of, of shared interest around it and also the prioritization of the activities because one thing we are learning is that as we go through this, this journey is um, you have to have some low-hanging fruits and some quick wins as well, right, in order to, you know, keep that momentum going and to demonstrate that they can be successful in, in these efforts while you are also focusing on some of the much more challenging, much larger investments um, that may take longer to, to pull together, to articulate and to pull together. Yeah, to answer your question about the NPV model, um, very good question. And it's, uh, of course, always difficult to come up with correct uh, predictions. Um, now, if you would be developing a uh, wind project, you would enter into a power purchase agreement. And for 20 years or 15 years, at least for the investment horizon, you have a fixed uh, a revenue stream. Um, and that makes it much more easier to finance something. Now, with agroforestry, it's very difficult. Now, to give you an example uh, of how we've approached this in, uh, in Benin, we're working with a, a local partner of ours, Eco Benin, uh, to develop the Mono River uh, project. And part of the revenue stream there will come from the uh, dredging sand and selling the sand into the, the, uh, the, the market. I, you know, very interesting. But how much money will your sand revenue generate? You know, I, we don't know. Uh, so we can, you know, we, we heard some figures. It's like three or, or it could be five or uh, so what do you do? Uh, well, if you don't have the resources, you come up with conservative numbers, first of all. Come always use conservative numbers and be able to validate that. Don't pluck them out of the air, but at least show that you uh, read a report somewhere that historically people paid uh, three uh, euros uh, per, uh, per, per ton, etc. But in this case, uh, we are uh, hiring a local expert to do the research for us. So what uh, does the sand market look like? Because you need to have validated numbers as much as possible. So we're spending some resources uh, to hire a local uh, expert. So there's a variety of ways of doing it. Most importantly, be able to show where your numbers come from. More questions? Yeah, thank you for uh, this presentation. I'm Herman Safnayev from Tropos. I had a question uh, because the model is very much focused on external financing sources, but how do you take into account uh, the local potential investment, co potential, the co-investment, and particularly the role of informal financing sources like uh, foreign transactions from family to family? Uh, how is that included? Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a quick stab at that and pass it on to you. To you, but uh, very important question um, because when we think about financing, it, it, it very quickly becomes very exotic, and we have to get the inv impact investors. You know, all, all good about your impact investors, but most investment is local, and that's captured in the approach. As a matter of fact, it's emphasized in the approach. Don't get too excited about you know, exotic structures, you know, keep it simple and keep it as local as possible. So as you go through the... Well, this is a, a cartoon version from something yeah. produced a couple of years ago, but yes. Yeah, because in, 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 in the Philippines, for example, in the CDO, um, there were local banks that were at the table and they were very interested. And, and one more thing, and then I'll shut up. Um, don't just involve banks because of the money. Uh, use that opportunity to also tap into the network and to their structuring capacity, to their thinking, because they're actually nice people, you know, bankers. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> more questions. <laughs> well, we know that. <laughs> it, 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 could I just quickly respond oh, sorry, to yeah. the, the uh, local financing? Um, I think excuse me, the private sector partners with whom we are working in Honduras um, obviously are extremely interested in, 
in uh, financing some of the activities at landscape level. There is a problem, for example, of oil palm encroaching on slopes, uh, which um, creates a lot of tension and a lot of conflict and also maybe outside of the national forestry laws and maybe outside of the principles and criteria of the RSPO certification. There's an interest in helping their producers to uh, substitute the oil palm with cacao and other centric um, agroforestry systems. So there is a willingness to finance there. But we need a higher level of financing in order to promote those agroforestry systems as the preferred alternative for sloped agriculture in Honduras as opposed to what is a more lucrative crop, oil palm, but not necessarily in a system that is planted on the slope because the costs are different, of course, and the logistics of harvesting and getting it out are more challenging. Um, so there is a, a high degree of interest in there. And I would even say that these uh, companies can serve as the um, uh, institution, the, the institution in order to be able to manage these investments because they have uh, the track record, they have the sophistication, and they have the interest in being able to um, facilitate some of these investments in the landscape. Thanks. Maybe just a very short remark on that as well. Um, the recent reports from the GIN, for example, show we still need 200 billion in investments for the four smallholders for landscapes. And local banks, local money can provide up to 25% or so of that. But I do think we still need to leverage and attract finance from all sources to make sure that we speed it up and skate it up and really make it bigger than we ever did before. No question? No, just a comment. <laughs> um, sorry, when, uh, when the IUCN mentioned the um, you hire um, local experts and it just made me think, um, and regarding the platform in general, how is it sustained uh, financially? How, who is investing in this platform in order to be able to deliver its service? I can answer that question because we implement this as part of our ongoing projects that are uh, focused on building capacity of CSOs to, uh, to work in landscape programs with a variety of actors. So these specific programs are geared towards influencing of policy, and policy, of course, is government policy, but also private sector policy. So in that context, there is funding to, to sustain this. But this is a very good question. Uh, Lyft comes with no, you know, there's no funding behind Lyft at this point, so it depends on the programs who are going to implement it, uh, whether they have their own funding. Other last questions? And if not, I would like to uh, once more thanks a lot, Omer, Michaelin, Seth, and Gerhard. Um, stay around. The pavilion is here uh, open for uh, further discussions. And uh, thanks a lot for your interest. Oh, yeah. Um, there, there is a, a web page that, um, do we have it somewhere? Lift, what, what's the web page, Lou? Liftkit.info. And then you it's, can... It's also in the two-pager, yeah. It says yeah. in the two-pager, yeah, yeah, but... And it was also just translated yeah. to Spanish.